Lecture 6, Atmospheric Pressure or Air Pressure. Um, it's defined as the weight of a column of air in the troposphere pressing down on the surface of Earth. And so the atmosphere exerts weight. And so we're going to imagine, you know, a column of air, say, you know, pressing down over Louisiana from about nine miles up to the surface. Now, the atmosphere is definitely exerting weight upon us. Now, we as humans don't feel it at all because it's counterbalanced by the fluids in our body. So it goes totally unnoticed. But I want to illustrate uh, the weight of the atmosphere by uh, introducing you to how the first barometer uh, was constructed. Now, a barometer is an instrument that's used to measure air pressure, and they're all computerized now. But uh, I'm going to go over uh, the simplified uh, uh, way that uh, air pressure could be measured, all right, so you understand the weight of the atmosphere. And so what we start with is uh, a test tube that's uh, three feet long or 36 inches tall. And so it's 36 to zero. And then you kind of imagine one inch increments. Now what you do is you fill that test tube completely with mercury. We abbreviate it HG. And mercury is a heavy liquid metal with good expansion and contraction properties that work well in, in a thermometer or a barometer. So we're, we're filling it up completely. And now what we're going to wind up doing is we're going to invert, we're going to tip that test tube filled with mercury into a dish of mercury. Now, what you would think if you, you know, tip something over that, you know, all the fluid would wash on out. But since we're, um, we're tipping it over in a dish of mercury that's exposed to air pressure, the mercury in the tube winds up being counterbalanced or balanced by the air pressure on the dish. And so let's take a look. We've got the we've got a surface exposed to the air pressure and the weight of the atmosphere is pressing down on the surface of of this dish of mercury. And it's actually able right, to keep the mercury in the tube, all right, at a height of 29.92 inches. Now, specifically, this experiment is done at sea level. And so, at sea level, the, the level of the mercury did wash out a bit, did fall about six inches. But at sea level, the air pressure in the dish, right, was able to support a column of mercury at precisely 29.92 inches in the tube. Now let's uh, take a look at this a, a little bit more to help you understand the weight of the atmosphere and how it can support mercury in a test tube. Let's first look at high pressure. When we have high pressure move in, what does that mean? It means that the atmosphere is exerting a greater weight upon us. So, um, so what we're trying to illustrate here is the atmosphere has a greater weight and it's pressing down on the surface of mercury exposed to it. And so we've got a, a greater weight and we've got a counterbalancing effect and that weight of the, of the, of the air is going to press down on the surface of the mercury and it's going to cause a rising barometer. And so any reading above 29.92 inches of mercury is considered a high pressure reading. It's a rising barometer. Now, conversely, when we have low pressure, we have a falling barometer. Now, when we have low pressure moving on in, what does that mean? The atmosphere is lighter, ex exerting less pressure on the surface of the earth, or in this case, this, the dish of mercury. So you kind of imagine lighter air pressure. And so that's going to allow the, uh, the mercury in the, in the tube to fall, to fall, because we have less pressure weighing down on the dish. And so we have a falling barometer. And so any reading below 29.92 inches of mercury is considered low pressure. Now, in modern meteorology, they use the, the metric unit. And there's a conversion from inches of mercury 
to the metric unit of millibars. And we don't have to worry about the mathematical formula. What I want to do is just give you uh, the equivalent reading in millibars. So standard sea level air pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury. Now in the metric unit of millibars, the standard sea level air pressure is 1,013 millibars, just over 1,000 millibars. And then the same thing, um, any reading above 1,013 is considered high pressure. And the highest reading you'll ever get on Earth is about a, uh, 1,040, and it usually approaches that in Siberia in winter time. That's where that usually occurs. And then the low, uh, low pressure, any reading below 1,013, down to about 900 millibars. It's the lowest pressure you ever get, usually in a very strong hurricane. All right. Now, what I want to do is uh, take a look at uh, a very important relationship with air pressure readings and altitude. And this is going to help you understand what I mean when I say standard sea level air pressure. What we're going to see is that air pressure decreases with increasing altitude, and it decreases quite dramatically. Now, we're just going to focus on air pressure readings in the troposphere. Uh, so we're going to start with no air pressure, a vacuum, zero. And then we're going to have increasing air pressure to just above 1,000 millibars to 1,013. And then we're going to focus on altitude in the troposphere. And here we've got the top of the troposphere showing at about 8 miles on up. And we're not going to worry about the stratosphere here. But we're going to take a look at the relationship of how air pressure decreases with increasing altitude. And we're going to start at sea level. Now, we in Thibodeau, we're located basically at sea level. Or New Orleans is located at sea level. And you can see our standard reading at sea level is indeed 1,013. And so that's our, our regular air pressure. We usually have pretty high air pressure. And now what that means is, now we can have high pressure move in. And so we've got our standard reading. So any reading above 1,013. Uh, would be represent high pressure moving in. So 1,014, 15, 16, on, on. Now we can have low pressure move in. And so we'll have a lower reading from our standard sea level air pressure. So 1,012, 1,011, what have you. Right. Now we have hot, the highest pressure at sea level because uh, you have to go back to the definition of what air pressure is. It is the weight of a column of air pressing down on a surface. And so since we're at sea level, we have the full weight of the atmosphere pressing down on us. And that's why at sea level, we have the highest air pressure readings. We have the full weight of the atmosphere. Now, let's go up a mile. Let's go to the mile high city of Denver, one mile up. Now the standard air pressure reading at one mile up is much less. It's only 800 millibars. Now, so at Denver, the standard reading of air pressure is 800 millibars. Now, they have, can have high pressure move in, all right? So they'll have a reading above their standard reading at a mile up, 801, 802, 803. That's high pressure. And then a reading for low pressure would be 799, 798, and on and on. And so again, why uh, do does Denver have much lower air pressure readings. Again, you imagine a column of air pressing on down. And since we're higher up, we're a mile up, you have less atmosphere, hence less weight. And again, you can go to the top of the Rocky Mountains, go to Pikes Peak uh, at three miles up, 14,000 feet or so. And at the top of Pikes Peak, uh, the standard reading is only 600 millibars. That's the standard reading. And again, you can have a little bit high pressure move in. You'll have a higher reading than 600. Low pressure move in. And so that standard reading will be lower. Right. And again, imagine a column of air pressing down on the top of the Rocky Mountains. And since you're three miles up, you have less atmosphere pressing down, hence less weight. Let's go to Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. Uh, 29,000 feet or about, uh, or about six miles up. Now, wow. The standard reading of air pressure on the top of Mount Everest is only 300 millibars. 
300 millibars. And again, high pressure can move in. You'll have a reading just above 300. And then a low pressure can move in. And you'll have a reading below that standard reading of 300 millibars. And again, uh, imagine a column of air pressing down uh, on the top of Mount Everest at 6 miles up. And that column of air... All right, is representing, you know, much less atmosphere, and the atmosphere is, is going to exert a lot less weight on the top of Mount Everest. So the conclusion is, uh, you have uh, less atmosphere, right, the higher you go on up uh, in the troposphere, and, you know, uh, with uh, higher altitudes, you're going to have less weight above you. And so there's less atmosphere, hence less weight, and with height in, in the troposphere. Now, have you ever heard of mountain sickness or uh, altitude sickness? And it's all related to this relationship of decreasing uh, air pressure with altitude. You get headache and nausea and all these horrible things. And what it is is, uh, you know, if you've got high pressure, and we're pretty used to high pressure since we're at sea level, that high pressure is pushing oxygen into our lungs. And we're pretty well oxygenated here, and we're used to a certain amount of oxygen, a lot of it, actually, because we're used to pretty high pressure. And then all of a sudden, say, within a day, maybe you, you fly to some high-altitude location. You're, you're at, the, you know, at, you know, at maybe 600 millibars, and you go to the Pikes Peak or something like that. And, that, and you're you know, almost at half of what, what you're used to. And, and so you, you're not having anywhere near as much air pressure pushing oxygen into your lungs that your body is used to and so you'll feel it i mean you're, you're less much less oxygenated until your body adapts it'll take a, a few days uh you know to get used to it now i mean if you if you're hikers on top of mount everest you c cannot survive on 300 millibars uh of of air pressure uh that 300 millibars is not pushing anywhere it's near as much oxygen that your body needs to survive you will die and so hikers on top of mount everest uh, need supplemental oxygen they have they have cans of oxygen in order to survive their hike to the top of mount everest all right not only does uh air pressure vary with altitude it also varies over the Earth's surface. And so here we've got an air pressure map or a weather map showing uh, centers of high, a uh, center of high pressure and a center of low pressure. Now on this map, we've got lines drawn in. And these lines are called isobars. And uh, the, the root word iso is Latin for equal and bars is referring to millibars of air pressure. And so the, what an isobar is, these are lines drawn on a weather map connecting points of equal air pressure. And so meteorologists are constantly, you know, making isobar maps. So we've got a center of low pressure here and a center of high pressure. And what winds up happening uh, is the isobars tend to form circular patterns around these centers of high and low. And what this circular pattern is representing is intensification of the low pressure or intensification of the high pressure. And here we've got you know the readings of high pressure getting more intense. And here we've got readings of the low pressure getting more intense. What I want to do now is introduce uh, this term pressure gradient that's shown on this diagram here. And let me give you the definition. A pressure gradient represents the difference in air pressure over the Earth's surface. And so that's what we've got. We've got a you know, difference in air pressure over the Earth's surface. We've got a gradient in pressure. But that gradient is a slope, and I want to illustrate the slope of air pressure and how we wind up with a slope of air pressure in the troposphere by showing you a simple diagram. All right. Now, in, um, in the troposphere, actually, what a high-pressure system actually acts like from the ground on up in the troposphere, miles on up, a center of high actually acts like a dome or a ridge of high pressure. 
almost like a mountain of air. And I know you've heard the term, uh, you know, when you've watched the weather, a dome or a ridge of high pressure sitting over us. And that's actually how the air acts, it's almost a mountain of air. Now, conversely, a low pressure center in the troposphere acts like a trough of low pressure or a valley of air. And again, meteorologists use, say, use that term. They say a trough of low pressure is moving on in. And so that's how the air is actually acting. So I've got a very simple diagram to illustrate how the air acts. And so we have a difference in air pressure over the Earth's surface. And what the pressure gradient does it causes air to move down slope. And that's what a pressure gradient does. It causes air to move, you know, out of the dome and into the trough. And we get air moving. And so on Earth, you know, in the atmosphere, what is air movement? It's wind. And so this is how wind is created. And the technical term for wind is pressure gradient. A pressure gradient is air movement, and air movement is wind. So we get air movement down slope. Now, wind speeds are proportional to the difference in air pressure. And so if you've got, you know, a, a really deep low pressure system, well, like a hurricane, I mean, it's a really intense low uh, versus the surrounding environment. And so you've got a really big difference in air pressure over the Earth's surface. And so that's, you're going to have a proportional winds and you're going to have really strong winds. If you don't uh, have much of a, a difference in air pressure, maybe the, the, the high is not that intense and the low is not that intense. You know, you just, you know, you might not have much of a wind or much of a gradient or have much air movement. Now, the thing about wind that you need to know is that uh, wind always blows out of high pressure and into low pressure. And that's why this simple diagram is kind of nice illustrating, you know, how air moves or how wind is created moving down slope. And so this is something you that yet you'll need to know, and I'm going to show you that. All right, now, unfortunately, uh, there is a, a complication to the simple movement of air out of high pressure and into low, the pressure gradient. And so it, uh, air does not move directly out of the high and into the low. It's deflected uh, to the right or to the left. And it's due to something you may have heard of before. It's called the Coriolis effect. And it's all due to the Earth's rotation. Because the Earth rotates, we do not have that direct movement of wind out of the high and into the low. It's at, the winds are actually turned. And what you need to know, that winds are always turned to the right in the northern hemisphere. Winds are always turned to the right in the northern hemisphere. And then to the left in the southern hemisphere. There's a reversal. And so let's take a look first at the northern hemisphere. Now these straight lines here are representing our pressure gradient set up by a high and a low. And we're getting air to move. But because the Earth is rotating, that's going to cause the air to be deflected to the right of its intended path. So this is the actual wind direction. And no matter you know where the pressure gradient or the direction of the pressure gradient is, here, in this case, you've got to turn yourself upside down from high to low. This is our pressure gradient. and But you've got to look upside down, and the wind is actually deflected to the right. And again, here we've got our rightward deflection. Now, the opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. If you've got your uh, pressure gradient set up, because the Earth is rotating, the actual wind direction is going to be deflected always to the left. And so no matter what direction you've got your air set up, the actual wind is always deflected to the left. And again, even though you're upside down here, you've got to always deflect to the left of the intended path. Now let's take a look at, you know, why we have the, the reversal uh, in each hemisphere. Why winds are actually deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and deflected to the left. And this, so there's this reversal in each hemisphere. And it, it is kind of a, a difficult concept to really wrap your brain around. Now, it is due to the Earth's rotation. 
So even though, I mean, the Earth rotates from west to east, no matter what, when you look at the rotation of the North Pole, so you, you're rotating west to east, and you, you know, point the North Pole, you know, directly at you, you will see the continents actually rotating in a counter clockwise manner. That's CCW, counterclockwise manner. Now you're still rotating west to east. Now point the south pole at you. And it is the craziest thing. You will see the continents now rotating in the opposite direction in a clockwise manner, even though the earth is still rotating west to east. Now the reason uh, is, all right, because the South Pole is upside down from the North Pole, it's opposite. And so the direction of movement is reversed. And that is the explanation in physics. And that is what it is. I just want to finish up um, the Coriolis effect uh, by showing you this simple example uh, in the United States. And you know the, the fact that it, Coriolis effect is due to the Earth's rotation, and so let's just say that we want to fly an airplane, and this would be our pressure gradient. Let's say we want to uh, fly uh, you know, from Ottawa to Miami, and we set our instrumentation, you know, due south, and so we're going to be flying, uh, you know, above the rotating Earth, just like you know wind is, right? So we set up wind, or, or we're flying in the air due south. Now the thing is, uh, I mean, do we do we reach Miami? No, because the Earth is rotating underneath us. We're going to wind up not in Miami uh, over those few hours of flight or the air moving, you know, uh, you know down the gradient. We're probably going to wind up being deflected to the right and probably well maybe wind up in New Orleans and so you, again you got to turn yourself upside down and we're going to have a rightward deflection and that's all due to the Earth's rotation. So now, now let's take a look at the wind circulation around centers of high, centers of high and centers of low pressure. Now what we've got here is uh, isobars Right. Circular isobar showing us, you know, the centers of low and the centers of high. Now, the thing is, we've got to look at the circulation in the northern hemisphere, and then we've got to look at the reversal of wind direction in the southern hemisphere. So let's start with uh, the center of low pressure. Now, in the language of meteorology, uh, the technical term for a low pressure system is called a cyclone. And so we're going to be using that term a lot when we're talking about cyclones uh, later on in the course. So we know, due to the pressure gradient, that winds always move inward to low pressure. So no matter what hemisphere you're in, it's uh, always going to be into a low pressure. Now in the northern hemisphere, uh, air is rotating. These are the, this is the air, the arrows are showing, uh, the winds are rotating around a low pressure system in a counterclockwise manner. Now, uh, you're familiar with, uh, hurricanes. I mean, they're big centers of low pressure. And this is hurricane season, and right now I think there are hurricanes forming. I want you to take a look at the satellite images, uh, on the weather maps, and you'll see the counterclockwise circulation of the clouds rotating around that cyclone, that center of low pressure. So take a note of that. Now, uh, in the, again, in the northern hemisphere, a center of high pressure, and here are our isobars again, and the wind direction. Now, a center of high pressure is the opposite of, of a low, and so it's called an anticyclone. That's the technical term. Now, we know that winds always blow out of a high, Right now, in the northern hemisphere, the winds are rotating around that high in a clockwise manner. Now, I've drawn in our straight arrow pressure gradient, all right, to represent the the air movement down slope out of the out of the dome and into the trough. But this is how wind is created. This is how we get air movement. Now, in reality, the air does not move directly out of the high into the low. Because of the, the Coriolis effect, 
winds are deflected to the right. And so we're in the northern hemisphere, and I want to show you, right, the air now is deflected to the right out of that high. And that rightward deflection sets up our clockwise flow. That's how it's set up. And so we got the clockwise outflow and then the inflow into the low, setting up a counterclockwise movement. Now let's look at the opposite circulation for the southern hemisphere. Now a low in the southern hemisphere is still called uh, a, a cyclone, even though I don't have it written down, but it is still called a cyclone. Now, of course, uh, air is still always moving inward, but the circulation is reversed. A low pressure in the southern hemisphere moves in a clockwise manner, clockwise. And then a high pressure center is still called an anticyclone. Air is still always going to move out of the high, but in the southern hemisphere, the circulation around a high pressure center is counterclockwise. And again, I've drawn in my straight line pressure gradient. And I, what I want to show you is in the southern hemisphere, winds are deflected to the left of the pressure gradient. And so we've got our leftward deflection from our pressure gradient. And that leftward deflection sets up our counterclockwise out spiral. And then we wind up with an in, inflow in a clockwise manner. And so that's how we wind up setting up the, the circulation. You need to know that circulation. Now, we're going to finish up with, uh, you know, why do we have centers of high pressure and centers of low pressure on weather maps at the Earth's surface? And there are two reasons that, uh, that create uh, differences in air pressure. And a major reason is the unequal heating of land and water on Earth. And you, sh you should recognize this diagram here when we, when we talked about the differences in the heating and cooling of land and water. And that is a major re reason for setting up high and low pressure systems. So let's start with maybe a superheated land surface, the hot surface. Now, the heated land heats the atmosphere above it. And we know that, you know, hot air uh, expands and rises. It becomes less dense. So I've got an arrow here showing the hot air rising over the superheated land. Now the, you know, the big question is what type of pressure have we just created? We have just created a low pressure system over the heated land. Now what we've got to do is we've got to remember we've got the the weight of the atmosphere pressing down on the land. So we imagine a column of air pressing down on the land. Now within this column of air, we've got the hot air rising against the weight of the atmosphere pressing down. And so that's going to wind up creating lower surface air pressure, lower air pressure readings, since we're working against the weight of the atmosphere. One thing I want to say right now to you, uh, and it will be fully explained once we get into material for exam two, you know this, whenever we have low pressure move in, we've got cloudy conditions and more than likely rain. Now, the thing is, in order to get a cloud and ultimately rain, you've got to have rising air. You've got to have rising air. Just think about it, uh, if you've ever watched a, a cloud uh, billowing and, and growing in summertime. You know, you can actually see the, you know, the upward air currents uh, forming the cloud and the cloud growing upward. And so you can actually see the rising air, you know, in growing clouds. And that's a you know, really good way to remember uh, that uh, low pressure has rising air. So this is really important. Besides the circulation that we, that I just explained, well, you know, the, uh, whether uh, it's clockwise or counterclockwise in each hemisphere and, mo um, and the air moving inward, you also need to know that for low pressure, the air is rising. All right, let's look at the cooler surface. So now uh, over the uh, cooler surface, the air in the atmosphere is chilled. It's chilled. 
and cool air contracts, becomes denser, and sinks. And so over this cooler surface, we wind up with sinking air in the atmosphere. Now, again, you've got to remember, you've got the weight of the atmosphere. We've got a column of air pressing down on this cooler surface. Now, working together with the weight of the atmosphere, you've got dense air sinking on the, on the Earth's surface. And that's going to create higher surface air pressure readings when you've got a cooler surface and sinking air. Now, when we have high pressure move in, think about it. We always have blue skies, cloud-free conditions. And the reason why high pressure is associated with clear skies and cloud-free conditions is because the air is sinking. And there is no way you can create a cloud if the air is sinking. And that will be fully explained again uh, for material in exam two. But let me just say one more time. We just went over the circulation around high pressure uh, in, the, in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And you absolutely need to know the circulation. But also, you need to know that always... The air is sinking in associated with a high pressure system. Right? You need to know the air is sinking with a high and rising with a low. Now there is a second reason that creates high and low pressure systems uh, over the Earth's surface. And it's just simply the airflow. And there, there are two ways to do it. Uh, you can just, you know, get the air you know, just starting to, to move in a clockwise or counterclockwise uh, movement. And I've got a, a diagram here of what's going on right now uh, with hurricanes. What winds up happening, you know, how we create a hurricane or, you know, or counterclockwise flow in a, in a center of low in the northern hemisphere is we start to create tropical waves. And during the summertime, we've got hot air moving from the equator, pushing upward. And that starts to create uh, a kind of a curving airflow or a wave pattern in the winds, in the tropics. And so we've got a tropical wave, and we've got num numerous tropical waves forming off of Africa right now. So you start to get the air curving, and as the tropical wave deepens, you can actually see by this curving action, you can start to create a counterclockwise circulation. So by just by getting air to start to move uh, in the correct direction. In this case, we're creating now, well, this is a tropical depression, and we've got counterclockwise airflow. And so you just get the air starting to move in the correct direction, and it can intensify. And in this case, I'm just showing you uh, creating a low pressure center that intensifies into a hurricane. Now, remember, that also associated with highs and lows it is rising or sinking air. And that's another way uh, to get the center of high or low pressure. And I want to show you the, the, the peninsula of Florida. Now, in, in summertime, it has a lot of thunderstorms and low pressure. And the reason is, in the afternoon, the peninsula of Florida has Atlantic sea breezes coming on in, and then also uh, sea breezes coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. And the, these converging winds at the Earth's surface are going to meet, and the air is going to be forced to rise. And we know that rising air is going to create clouds and ultimately thunderstorms. And so you've got rising air creating low pressure. Now, conversely, I don't have an illustration here, but uh, at the top of the troposphere, there are upper level winds. And sometimes upper level winds, you know, eight or nine miles up can converge. And when, when you've got converging winds at the top of the troposphere, the winds are going to wind up converging. Now, they can't rise into the stratosphere because there's no there's no air pressure and there's no and there's no uh there's no weather that takes place there so the converging winds are forced to sink 
And we know that sinking air in the troposphere creates higher surface air pressure. So we can wind up, you know, mechanically, you know, getting air to rise or sink, creating high and low, or getting the air mechanically to move in, in the correct direction. That concludes Lecture 6.